If a good education is the great leveler in society, how do we get more young people from lower income households to go to college or university? Associate Professor Jennifer Robson from the Riddell Graduate Program in Political Management at Carleton University has some ideas on that, and she joins us now from the nation's capital. Jennifer, good to have you on again. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Good. Let's just put a couple of bullet points up here from your study that you did for Ontario 360, then we'll chat about these. You tell us nearly 70% of youth who grow up in Ontario will continue their education after high school, whether through college or university, and that is the highest rate of any province in Canada. So that's the good news. Yep. Between 2011 and 2015, full-time enrollments in Ontario undergraduate degree programs have continued to grow, rising 7% among universities and 26% among colleges. Again, more good news. However, just 55% of kids with parents in the bottom income fifth are enrolled in college or university by age 19, 55%, compared to more than 84% of kids with parents in the top income fifth. So let's start there. How significant a problem would you say that is? I think it's a, I think it's a very significant problem. Um, in terms of thinking about uh, equality of opportunities, right, and, and leveling life chances in the province, Look, I, I want to say again that the province has made significant gains in terms of promoting access to higher education, and here I'm, I'm using it in the most inclusive sense, right? So university, college, trades training. Um, so so the, the fastest growth in terms of looking at the link between parental income and whether or not a kid goes on to that, that advanced education, the fastest growth has been in the bottom 20%, but we still see that huge gap, right? And so I worry about the replication of, of cycles of disadvantage at the bottom end of the income scale and the replication of cycles of advantage at the top end of the income scale. And so how can we, how can we close that gap? That's well, my question. The Ontario government, I guess a couple of budgets ago, offered what they called free to for uh, students coming out of lower income households. What kind of impact has that made so far? I think, I think we're still a little early. I don't know that we've actually seen impact analysis of that, of that tuition grant yet. Um, what I look at in my study is, is a way that we can actually make a modest adjustment to exactly that system to uh, do a better job of intervening, not only uh, providing more support lower down the income scale, but also intervening earlier, right? Because right now our systems to promote access to higher education are really focused on that point at which kids have already been successful all the way through, you know, grade school and high school, and have already made the decision and the choice to apply to college or university or a trades program. So I'm really interested in asking that question, what can we do to intervene earlier and to direct more support uh, lower down the income scale where we know it can make a bigger difference. Well, pursue that if you would. Earlier intervention yeah. means what and how? Sure. So uh, the recommendation that I make in the paper is to make a very small adjustment to that existing tuition grant, which, as you say, is effectively eliminating tuition for many Ontario students, right? So previously we relied on a complicated system of tax credits that we're, we're learning through the economic research really don't make an impact on who goes and who doesn't to education. So they made a, they made a wise move in converting that into cash assistance so that, um, that you know, that, that can have a bigger, bigger impact. We hope anyway, still still too soon. But like I said, that, that assistance is only happening when kids are already at the point where they are going into university and college and trades programs. We know that the decision to get there is impacted by a whole range of, of, of events that lead up to that, right? So as early as, as you know, preschool and, and primary school, are kids feeling that education is important and valued? Are they in a home environment that actually promotes their thinking about their longer term um, education and aspirations? Right, so we have a lot of those sort of like non-financial barriers. Uh, so Ross Finney has talked about those a lot in his research, and that it's really those non-financial barriers that we need to address. So I am saying, how can we use some of the financial tools that we've got to try and actually get at those non-financial barriers by providing the aid earlier? So in this case, providing um, a uh, essentially a birth grant. For low-income kids. So if we make a very small adjustment at the top end, because right now those tuition grants are going to kids who come from quite wealthy families, families that are making about 170 percent of the median income in the province of Ontario. I don't think those grants are making a difference to whether or not those kids are able to attend college or university. But if we can provide those grants in a more targeted way to kids um, at birth in the province, maybe we can start to change some life chances. Well, here's an idea they've tried in Oklahoma, apparently, with a $1,000 grant 
into a so-called education savings account for each child in the state of Oklahoma. How do you like that idea? I think it's a really interesting idea. The one thing I would say about the Oklahoma project, though, is that it's universal. So it's not targeted by, by income. And that does increase the overall cost um, of the program itself. The early results, um, so the kids, the first kids who, who were eligible for that program are, are at the stage now where they're just getting into public school. And uh, the early results, though, are suggesting some really positive effects that, that when you account for socioeconomic status, the kids who got the grant and are coming from low-income families are actually getting to school um, with better indicators in terms of early development and readiness to learn. Hmm. That's really promising. So if you were going to tailor that kind of a program to the province of Ontario with, a, again, a so-called provincial education mm -hmm. bond for, yep. I presume, lower-income Ontario households and the kids who live in those households, what would that look like exactly? So in the in the uh, in the report, I suggest starting. It's a you know it's an incremental approach. I'll grant you that we can we can sort of think about this and maybe build build bigger, build more ambitiously. But at least this is something that is very feasible. It could be rolled out tomorrow, and here's why: because Canada already has a system of education savings plans called registered education savings plans. Um, there's some emerging research that suggests that kids who have the plans are, regardless of family income, more likely to uh, go on to higher education. There's also really good evidence that um, access to financial uh, uh, assets makes a big difference in education performance, even you know, with the Oklahoma grant at primary school all the way through high school as well. So let's use that existing infrastructure. The federal government already has a series of uh, income tested grants as well as so matching savings grants for if families want to deposit money in, but they also have an income tested bond of $500. The federal government in the most recent budget announced a system in the province of Ontario alone that is now every time that a child is born in the province and parents go online to register their birth, they're going to be piggybacking on that, that so-called birth bundling system. So parents can go on and actually use that system to start the process of, of opening up an RESP. So a lot of the, like the complicated design work of how do we figure out how to actually move the money, how do we figure out who to, how, who to target, how do we figure out what kind of account to put it in, that part has already actually been figured out. And so this is really about creating a provincial incentive that matches the federal one. And then uh, through the miracle of compound interest, we mm -hmm. can actually see an important asset grow as a child is, is growing and going through the school system in, in Ontario. You know, of course, that sometimes governments, uh, you know, not necessarily through any fault of their own, they're well-intentioned, but there can be sort of perverse consequences to well-intentioned policies. And I wonder if you're worried at all about, uh, you know, a, a provincial education bond, which let's say starts every kid off or, or kids from low-income households with a thousand bucks, whether that in some sense is not a, a disincentive for families, therefore, to save themselves for their kids' education. What do you think? Okay, so that's, it's a really interesting question, but I think it belies a premise that it is um, that the act of saving, right, is the important act that shows a family is committed to their child's education. And the fact of the matter is, when I look at the data uh, on households who are saving and who are not in education savings plans, low-income families don't say they're not saving because they don't expect their kid to go to university. They're saving. They're saying they're not saving because they can't afford to. Mm -hmm. Right? They have too many other competing economic pressures. So um, setting aside that issue around saving or not, right? The fact of the matter is what we want is to get that effect out of the asset, right? Having, having a child know that they own an asset that is dedicated uh, for them and for their higher education so that it, it changes their perception, right, around what's possible for them. So um, uh, behavioral economists um, have long established this phenomenon called the, uh, the endowment effect. Um, it was sort of first studied in university campuses where professors would give fairly, uh, fairly uh, kind of boring coffee mugs to students and see what happens. And it turns out that if you get something as dull as a coffee mug, notwithstanding what you know about the actual market value of that coffee mug, because you now own it, you're going to value it more, <laughs> right? This is the same reason, you know, people hang on to houses that they, like, they just refuse to drop the sale price and they're going to hang on to that house because, you know, it's their house, it matters to them. Um, so, so what we're trying to think about here is how do we create that endowment effect 
right? So that it actually can change some of the um, some of the forward outlook, some of the optimism, and some of the early school success that we know is really really important to getting to kids getting kids to that point where they're even thinking about applying for college, university, or a trades program, and then are able to access the current system of provincial assistance. I got about 30 seconds left, which is enough time to ask you, if we do what you okay. suggest, take us 10 years down the road, how will the post-secondary yep. system and the people who are in it be better? Okay, so uh, one thing, in addition to this idea of a bond, I'm also suggesting that we need to do a much better job of connecting uh, kids from low-income families and low-income communities to higher education um, sooner. So programs like Pathways to Education are an interesting model in Manitoba. There's a great program called Career Track. So in addition to doing this bond, let's also do some services. So how will that be better? It'll enable colleges and universities to have greater resources and support um, to do what a lot of them are already trying to do, right, which is to become more open, to become more accessible, to do a better job of reaching out to uh, students who are going to be first in family, right? And so if we can help universities and help, you know, they, they have a job to do as well. Colleges have a job to do. Um, they're trying. And I think that these are, these are kind of complementary measures that help to meet them in, in closing that gap. Okay. That's one of 30 ideas people can read about. Free advice for the next Ontario government. All of them at ON, short for Ontario, 360.ca. Jennifer Robson from Carleton University, thanks for coming on to TVO tonight. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.